Council Member Hamilton? Here. Council Member Marty Medina? Here. Council Member Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor Mason? Here. Mayor Rico Medina? Good afternoon, Javon Grogan, um, city. Feedback? Okay. Good afternoon, Javon Grogan, city manager. All right, we're here tonight for our uh, development town hall. Uh, let us begin with a overview of uh, what we will be discussing tonight. Uh, we'll begin uh, with a part one, a overview of projects that are uh, underway and being planned by the San Bruno Park School District, and that presentation will be provided by Matthew Duffy, the superintendent. Uh, we then will go into a part two, which is a overview of general development projects, primarily uh, private projects that are uh, being planned, uh, studied uh, in and around San Bruno, and that presentation will be provided by Darcy Smith, our assistant city manager. Uh, the final part, part three, We'll discuss our city projects, so a number of city projects, um, our capital improvement projects and infrastructure projects that are uh, underway and planned. We will have Q&A after each part of tonight's presentation, uh, and you have the time allotments uh, there. So without further ado, and in order to get our night started, I will now turn the presentation over to Matthew Duffy, the superintendent for the San Bruno Park School District. Good evening, everybody. Um, am I click? Oh, thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Just give me one quick second to make sure I have our clicker working so I can move our slides. Just to the right. Great, thank you so much, and uh, I apologize for the delay. Um, so I'm Matthew Duffy, I'm the superintendent of the San Bruno Park School District. Uh, this is my first year with the district, and uh, it's been a fantastic year so far, working with our team and continuing to build on a lot of the projects and initiatives uh, that have been going on for a number of years. So really happy to be part of the town hall this evening to share a little bit about what we're doing across the district in terms of uh, development, uh, with our school properties uh, and some of the other things happening around the district. So I'm gonna dive right into it and then happy to take some questions. Um, all right. Ah. Man. Should I be pointing this at something? You want to 
click it for me? Yeah. Okay. So we go to our next slide, thank you. Um, so in the San Bruno Park School District, uh, this year, even before facilities, we're working on five big goals across the district. Uh, the first is to strengthen and stabilize Parkside Middle School. That's been a big focus for us, making that the best middle school it possibly can be. The second work that we're doing is around supporting English learners. The third, and this really relates to tonight, is uh, making sure we deliver well a set of community projects, mostly around facilities. Uh, the fourth is really looking at our instructional program, and the fifth is improving some of our internal systems. So now turning towards our facilities, um, we can go one more. So as many of you know, uh, one of the biggest pieces of work that the district has been uh, going through over the last number of years is the construction of Allen Elementary School. Uh, that's the conceptual design of Allen, and we are almost 80% of the way through the project. So all of the students are in the building uh, in Allen, and the phase two part of the construction finishes uh, at the end of January. We can flip to the next slide. So here's a quick timeline of what's going on at Allen. Um, so we started phase one construction, June 2021. It's been a really fast moving project. We completed phase one in August and moved all of the students into the main building. Um, so we built the main building and the multi-purpose room and the kindergarten wing. And right now, if you pass the school, you'll see so much more construction happening. We're finishing all the fields, landscaping, play areas, library, and that's all done at the end of January 2023. Um, so want to share a little bit about the current projects happening across uh, this, the district and the city. So uh, thanks to the very generous support of the citizens of San Bruno, uh, we are working from our facilities bond, Measure X, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so the major project from Measure X uh, is Allen Elementary School. The next major project that's coming from Measure X funds is the renovation of the Parkside Intermediate School Science and Arts Building. So we have a science and arts building at Parkside that is aging, and we are gonna take that building down, redesign it, and rebuild that space that will be dedicated to arts, science, multiple classrooms. That design will go all through next year, and then the following year into the 24-25 school year will begin the construction. Um, the rest of that project, or the rest of the funding for that major project will come from the sale of our Engval property, uh, which is where the golf driving range is located, and we, have complete, we are almost completed with that sale. We can turn to the next slide. Um, just a little bit more about the Parkside project because it is a signature project for us. We're really excited about it. Uh, it will provide a new library, new science classroom and labs, an updated kitchen. We're already moving to a lot more scratch cooking in our kitchen just there the other day and really nice to see us moving away from just heating and serving and cooking a lot of our food from scratch new performing arts classrooms, a new main office, a new drop-off area. Those of you who've been by Parkside know it's a very tight drop-off area and renovation of the gym and locker rooms. And what you see italicized there are parts of this project that are already underway. So Allen has been the big one, Parkside comes next. Um, so wanted to share a little bit about the former El Crystal Elementary School. Um, we are moving our maintenance and transportation department into that building. With the sale of the Engval property, that's where our current maintenance department is located, so we've needed to find uh, a new home for them. It's a pretty small department compared especially to the city, so we're gonna first move our maintenance uh, group 
over there. And then we are exploring as a district, moving our district headquarters uh, to that space in the 24-25 school year. It's a beautiful space and a really amazing location, and we'd like to take advantage of it. We can move on. Um, another big project that we are exploring are the playing fields across our schools. So we have multiple playing fields uh, at our schools that are, to be frank, in poor condition. Uh, they're grass fields at many of our schools, um, like in front of John Muir, up at Portola, uh, even Rollingwood, and those schools, um, those fields are in need of repair and we're really exploring what would it look like to create turf fields across many of our schools. Um, so we're going through that process right now to not just you know, have a benefit for our schools, but a benefit for the community as well. So that's a big project that we're working on right now as well. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are very, very grateful to the citizens for the approval of the Measure X bond in 2018, and that provides the bulk of our funding for these capital improvements. And then we have another fund, which we call sale of land, uh, and that's coming from the sale of our Engval property. And those two uh, funds make up the bulk of what we're using for our facilities improvements across the district. I did want to say something about Rollingwood Elementary. Uh, we are closing Rollingwood Elementary School at the end of this school year. Uh, students and staff will vacate the building in June of 2023. Our goal is to keep the building occupied in some manner to avoid neglect issues while potentially earning some additional revenue. We're exploring some of the private preschools, maybe renting some of that space to them. But right now, our elementary schools are so small, and we are in declining enrollment, which I will share in a little bit, uh, that we do need to finish that process and move to four schools instead of five. So one of the pieces of work we're doing around the district in relation to the facilities is we are reboundarying the school district. Um, so we have had five elementary school boundaries for five elementary schools. Now that we're moving to four elementary schools, we're taking the opportunity to create four boundaries across the district. We're actually releasing those maps for the first time on Friday, and they'll be discussed at this Wednesday, a week from Wednesday's board meeting, and then we'll uh, try to approve the final maps in January. So we can go to our next slide. Um, this is a map of our five boundaries and shows a little bit about where students live and where they go to school, and this will move from five to four. Thank you for moving these slides for me. Um, and one of the things I think it's important to note, whether it's talking about rolling wood or talking about the boundaries, is that um, the number of students in our district is declining. And despite uh, the development that's coming, uh, based on our last demographic report, we expect to continue to see the numbers of students declining, as is happening in 85% of the districts across California, uh, and especially here in the Bay Area with some of the factors around cost of living, um, really showing that we have fewer families. We can go on to our next slide. And so what you'll see here are the historical enrollment trends uh, of our district. So you can really see that back in 2013-14, we had over 2,700 students. This year, we're just at a few students over uh, 2,000. We can go to our next slide. Um, you can also see on this slide, you see that the local births <laughs> uh, are continuing to decline. So not only are we losing folks who are moving out of the area, the number of babies born uh, in the region as well is also declining. And for folks who are interested in this, this comes from a recent demographic study that I'm happy to share that has tons of data about what the future for our district in terms of students is looking like. Um, one of the things we'll also look at is new construction 
and how, how many students are generated from new construction. So one of the things we see or hear is, well, there's a lot of new development coming to San Bruno, and there is, and that's super exciting, and you're gonna hear you know, from a lot of the speakers tonight about that new development, which is exciting. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that thousands of more students are coming into our schools. Uh, you can actually see that just on the left there, uh, one single family home is actually uh, projected to produce 0.11 student. <laughs> Not that we should see our students in decimals, but one home doesn't equal one student. One home equals really one-tenth of a student, so you have to have 10 homes to really get to one student. And then you see more, um, you see a little bit less as we have different kinds of units and a little bit more as we go towards the more affordable side. We can go to our next slide. Here is our big projections across the district, and you can see by 2930, and this is what we call our moderate enrollment projection, so there's, you know, we have a low, moderate, high, but this is kind of the middle one, shows that by 2930, uh, we're gonna have about 1,700 students, so we continue to decline. And I think that's important for this uh, meeting just around our facilities and this kind of question, well, would rolling wood potentially come back online when we see more development? And right now, hey, things might change, but right now it looks like we've gotta find another use for that um, facility. We can continue to go on. This uh, shows you, this is a great slide, and I know uh, my city colleagues will talk about it, but it shows you all the development coming, and we've worked in conjunction with the city so that we, sh we have a really nice partnership. The total amount of units, you see over 2,300 new units coming to the city, but really only about 250 students projected from that. Um, so that's pretty sobering for us in some ways, and just we have to be really strategic in making sure we're managing the facilities uh, the right way. All right, so this is just a map. Uh, some of what you see in the yellow is some of the new developments coming, and so, or that kind of gold uh, that you see, and so we're thinking about that and looking at that as we continue to think about schools, enrollment boundaries, and how that's all gonna play out. Um, and that's it uh, for me. We have, I have lots of other slides that we could share with you, and um, I know this deck is public, so there are other slides in the appendices that um, might be helpful for anybody who wants to dive in a little more deeply into our data. Um, so with that, um, I'm really happy to stop and take questions, uh, whether those are in-person questions or online. I'm sure you guys will, will help uh, facilitate that. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Assistant City Manager Darcy Smith. I'll take over. So typically we'll go to audience questions and then online questions in case anyone joining us virtually wants to raise their hand. If you have an online question, we'll bring you the mic. No, yes? There's one back there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hi, good evening, I'm Charles Meyer. I don't contribute any students to the district and my question was, is the school district um, carrying very much debt? No, we are not. Um, so we are in a really strong financial position uh, right now, we have very strong reserves. So the business team that's there now and before me, I think has done some serious work. I know a number of years ago, we were in not such a strong financial position. Um, we closed the books uh, just a couple of months ago and uh, we really ended up with strong reserves, almost 20%. Uh, so we're, we're doing very well in, in that manner. Hi, I'm Jim Evangelist. Um, I see that you have plans to put more plastic over the fields, uh, like we've done at 
Cappuccino High School, which is 100% plastic now virtually. Um, how do you think that's going to square with the new demands coming from the state and the um, EPA regarding uh, pollution of the bay from runoff? Uh, how do you intend to tackle that? I mean, these fields have always been cared for in the past, uh, and for some reason, they apparently can't be managed well enough to be cared for now. Um, how do you square that? Uh, and also, we have an aquifer that we contribute to uh, that does go in through uh, ground that's not covered in plastic and many layers of what, however they're doing it. Yeah. So how, how do you think yep. that's Well, really that's fair? a really good question. I think the, what we want to do is make an investment into the fields. Uh, we feel like the fields are not playable at the level we'd like them to be. Um, so, you know, we're going to explore and get some estimates on what it would look like to do turf, but we also need to look at what would it look like to, you know, redo it if we wanted to sod it. Um, so we're going to look at, look at it all ways. Um, we know that there are pros and cons to each approach for sure, and I think you raised some really good points, uh, but we would like to have green spaces that our kids can play on um, every day, so that's where we're going with it, but I definitely hear you in terms of some of the pros and cons environmentally of using turf. I'd like also have the future of a, of a bay that is not polluted with microplastics. Um, I am wondering about um, the redistricting. Mm. I, I understand the reason for it, what you're talking about. I'm very interested in maintaining the district that I'm in right now. What opportunity is there going to be for input from the public on that? And yes. currently, there's not a child residing at our home, school-aged child, but I think some of my property values are key to the orbit of the school that's walking distance mm -hmm. from us now. Yep. So we have had seven, eight community meetings uh, around this process. We've met at, with all the school communities. We've done two bigger open meetings just to get as much input and engagement as we can to produce these first maps. Like I said, they'll be published on Friday and at our board meeting next Wednesday, the board will look at the first set of maps. So that's a place that the part, this is the pros and cons of this map. Um, so the community can weigh in there and then we're hoping through that discussion, it's enough direction to get us to the January board meeting where we'll look at them one final time and hope the board, with community input again, can make a final decision. So you have two board meetings you can give input on. I'm easy to find and can take you know, individual personal input um, as we finalize the process. Are these, are these meaningful, are these meaningful um, input at this point? Would any of the input maybe change some of the maps that are put forward if it's yeah. recommended? So I think we had sort of, we have two stages of it. Look at the maps, give feedback on them, perspective. You know, anytime you put multiple maps out there, folks are gonna advocate and say, I really like map A or B or C. So I think there's gonna be a lot of engagement about these maps. Thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to ask whether um, the MOT yard, whether that has been shared with the neighborhood surrounding it? It and has not been shared. Um, and that is on our list to get done, is just to make sure the direct neighbors really understand there's gonna be some movement. Um, we've been doing just a little bit of like painting and just some work to get it back up on to do. I think it's in January. Um, 
So you, you raise a good point about making sure folks know. Yeah, because I think um, just being on the council, the last communication to the community was that we were in negotiations for the property. Yep. And so unfortunately that fell through. Um, and so I don't know that there's a lot of excitement about an MN throughout the city. We really have. We have talked about it. Um, we don't have a lot of great spaces for this. I also worked with the city manager a little bit to look at some of the places city, the city is exploring down the road potentially for an MOT yard, and that might work for us down the road. We just have to be out of the Engval property this summer, um, so we need a space. We looked a little bit at the district office space, so we definitely explored options. We're also really trying to kind of we don't have any heavy trucks. All we have are, you know, vans, really, and we don't even have very many of those uh, who are enjoying the park. We have really made that commitment. Um, so we think we'll be able to do a good job aesthetically so folks feel like the green space that they're inhabiting in the park um, is authentic. Um, but we do need to, you know, make sure we communicate out with folks about what's happening. Okay, so I don't see that we have any virtual hands raised. Uh, and so with that, uh, Matthew, uh, I want to say thank you. Thank and we're you. Gonna go thank, to you. The thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Next segment. Thank you. Okay, and so I'll introduce uh, our assistant city manager, Darcy Smith, who will uh, provide an overview of private development happening in and around San Bruno. Heard that, know that we will broad rebroadcast uh, this town hall. It is available in person at the Senior Center and on Zoom, as well as on the city's YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, we are having technical difficulties with uh, having sound on channel one. Um, so uh, I do apologize for that, and I, I know our technicians are working on that. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. My name is Darcy Smith. I'm the City of San Bruno Assistant City Manager, and I'll be kicking off the city's presentation. We have a great lineup tonight. Not as exciting the world, as the World Cup, but our little World Cup here in San Bruno. Also joining us is the city's planning housing manager, Michael Laughlin, and one of our senior planners, Matt Newbomber. They're the ones who really make the magic happen with everything I'm gonna show you tonight. And if you have any follow-up questions, they'd be some of the folks you'd talk to down at City Hall. So I'll be presenting on general development updates. Um, there's a lot going on here for a small city and various stages, so I have a lot to cover. And I'll kick off talking about one of the key council priorities, which is proactive planning for the future. And the council does this first and foremost through our city long-range plans. These are plans that the city planners, our consultants prepare, they take many years to prepare, and they really are what I would describe as our long-range growth plans looking out 20 years that provide the vision, development regulations for private development projects. So largely everything I'm gonna talk about is mostly on private, private property, a little bit blending into the streetscape. Um, then the other city team will talk about more about public projects. But as you can see here in this map, there's a big range of development projects throughout the city. I know this is hard to read, but um, I'll cover these in more detail. And again, they're distributed throughout the city, and that's nice um, so that no neighborhoods receive an over-concentration of development. This shows areas where we've prepared city long-range plans for future transit-focused growth in the city. We are very fortunate to be blessed in the city with BART, Caltrain, and SAM trans through our major corridors. Um, and we're really trying to move into the future to promote not just transit usage, but bicycle, pedestrian um, usage to reduce vehicle trips. So here you see, starting from the top, the Tan Fran site in red, which I'll talk a little bit about. That's our current planning, major planning sites. Um, in the pink to the left is the Bay Hill specific plan area. And in the blue, there are transit quarters plan area, which is, includes our downtown. These are all areas where we forecast future growth um, focused around our transit quarters and stations. So again, the city approved the transit quarters plan going on about nine years ago, 2013. We, the city council adopted the downtown streetscape plan 
October 2019, and most recently the Bay Hill Specific Plan in September 2021. Again, those are all sort of big visioning documents um, with land use regulations and look out at a long time span. So I won't spend too much time talking about those, just hit some high points. The Transit Corridors Plan, if you haven't heard about that, um, again, focused on, guess what, our transit corridors. Um, and it's the community's vi vision developed over many years and many meetings um, to facilitate revitalization of the downtown and the transit quarter shown here, El Camino Real, San Bruno Avenue, San Mateo. Um, full build out of the plan sounds like a lot, but again, when you spread it out over 20 or 25 years is up, up to the maximums, about 1,600 new units, a million square feet of office, and about 150,000 square feet of new commercial space. And again, that's typically infill development. We have a few vacant lots. Some of them we have approved projects on that I'll show you. But largely when we talk about what's called infill, it's taking an underutilized site, um, maybe it has one story buildings and proposing new development that has multiple stories. Um, and again, economic revitalization back nine years ago was a big part of this plan coming out of um, the recession and the end of redevelopment in California. The city was looking at new sources of revenue. The downtown streetscape plan, which was approved by the council in 2019, focuses more on the streetscape. So again, it's a little bit different than a traditional land use plan, but it talks about creating a clear and unified vision for the streetscape in our downtown to create a sense of place, downtown identity. Um, and we're starting this off in stages. The first stage, I know no one gets excited about trash cans, but the ones in the downtown are very beautiful and functional and a major upgrade to our old cans. So sometimes you can smart small and have a quick win, but we do hope to move forward with implementation of this plan. Over time, um, there's a lot of really cool art features, um, such as this gateway sign, a lot of um, new, tr new improvements, such as street trees <laughs> that are really planted in the ground and can grow up. There was a, um, a few trees planted in front of the Aperture Project, which I'm pleased to say are doing quite well, um, but that gives you sort of some vision for what can be accomplished if we improve all the sidewalks, plant street trees, spruce up the lighting, put in new benches, um, new planters, et cetera. Moving on to the Bay Hill specific plan, that was a big multi-year effort, again, led by our planning team and Mr. Neubaumer to prepare a vision for that area. The final plan included growth over, again, a long time, 20 years, but up to two and a half million square feet of new office space, again, infill, building on parking lots, um, some removal of existing buildings and replacements, up to 573 housing units through overlay zones and potential future hotel expansion and civic use. In reality, at this point in time, what's being proposed in that area is the YouTube campus, which I'll talk about and show some construction photos. Currently under construction with the phase one of five phases, um, two through five would come in the future. So YouTube is the big office owner and tenant there. They own 10 different properties sprinkled throughout that Bay Hill specific plan area. They have plans to add 2.1 million square feet of new office space, again, over many years. Phase one, which is at 1300 Bay Hill Drive and 1350 Grundy Lane is under construction. I'll show you some photos. I guarantee you they're the most exciting construction photos in the city right now. So there's the big pit, hopefully not full of mud but probably is for a little bit. Um, and then 1400 and 1450 Bay Hill Drive, those sites are behind this building that you see here between um, west of Cherry and east of 280. Those are also under construction, but in the framing stages, so a little bit further along. This again shows that Bay Hill specific area plan and aerial view. This is the land use plan. Um, as I mentioned, there's a housing overlay. You see the hatch mark here, but just really important to note for the public that the Bay Hill Shopping Center has a requirement that the re amount of retail or commercial square footage isn't reduced. So even if housing is proposed, that retail, um, those retail serving uses are preserved, um, and if housing was developed, it would be on the upper floor um, and part of a mixed use project. And also note, YouTube is building a multimodal hub on their property so shown here in the star. This is an aerial of the new YouTube campus under construction. Again, right now we've got huge excavated, I call them pits, but you know, they're really um, the future underground garages, um, but they are being built on former parking lots that you see um, there. And though that construction includes two three-story office buildings, 
and we'll also include the realignment of stra and straightening of Grundy Lane. That'll be part of this first phase and that multimodal hub, which will keep buses off of our city streets. Um, there'll also be a new plaza at Cherry Avenue and Grundy Lane with public access and seating that will be really nice. So this is a rendering looking uphill on Grundy Lane for the first phase. And I promise you some exciting pictures. Again, I call this the big pit. Don't, please don't anyone think they, they can go play or BMX there? No, this is a pretty big pit and um, it'll be filled ultimately with multiple levels of underground parking so that no one sees the parking and the buildings will be above. But it's pretty impressive stage right now. Um, and this is the uphill project, again, uh, west of Cherry, 1400, 1450 Bay Hill Drive. Again, that's in the framing stage. They also had a big pit and filled that in. Um, it's exciting construction project. So now move into other general projects in various stages throughout the city. Um, highlight some recently completed project. This is actually a really nice project because it not only built, built 30 uh, multifamily rental units and 40 single family homes, but these apartments are part of the college district's employee housing program with the affordable units assigned to staff and faculty um, at below market rates. And again, if you haven't been up there, it looks really nice. It was completed in September. Another newcomer to the city inside the shops at Tanfran is the temporary auto dealership for Hyundai and Genesis. So again, if you haven't been there, it's quite a nice showroom. Um, and they'll be there temporarily until they move across the street to the crossing site. I'll mention that later. Um, but this project at the temporary location was approved by the council in July and opened in October 2022. So talk a little bit about projects in various stages. So I thought it'd be nice to just pause here and explain, well, what are these different phases? The planning and environment review and action phase is the first phase where we have city council meetings, plan commission meetings, architecture review committee meetings, um, and that can take anywhere from 12 to 24 months for some of these bigger projects. Um, we certainly process smaller projects like single family home additions or use, use permits, um, things that take, take less time, but the bigger projects can take one to two years. Then sometimes there's a little bit of a pause. Sometimes the market um, forces can affect the timeline and sometimes the property owners seek to sell the sites. And there's actually a few sites I'll talk about that have been approved that are on the market now. But the next step after the entitlement or after a new owner comes on board is to prepare the permit plans. And that actually spent, is a lot, very time intensive for some of these bigger projects. The plan sets are literally inches thick so that architects and civil engineers can spend six to nine months preparing those plans. Again, for big projects, for smaller projects, it's, it's much shorter. Um, but once the city receives those permits, then it can also take us six, nine, sometimes 12 months to review all the permits. And then construction can take 12 to 24 months. So it's a, it's a long time frame again, but sometimes these overlap. So for YouTube um, and the auto dealership, because they run a little bit of a tighter time frame and they knew they were gonna go forward with the project, um, do concurrent processing of the planning entitlements and the building permits. And so YouTube got started a lot quicker. We expect the auto dealership on the new site to get started um, hopefully this summer. And so we can condense these time frames if the applicant property owner wants to. Um, now I'll talk about some of the projects that again are in various phases um, of that flow chart I just showed you. 500 Sylvan Avenue, nine multifamily units approved by the council back in May 2019. There's a new owner, so they're evaluating how to proceed. 160 El Camino Real, new hotel with 28 guest rooms on a vacant lot. That was approved by the Planning Commission in May 2021, currently for sale. So that kind of gives you an example of when projects don't necessarily proceed quickly to the building permit stage because they're either sold or, in, or on the market, um, take a little pause. Um, Mills Park Center is a big project. It's a mixed use project with 427 multifamily housing units, about 8,000 square feet of commercial space on El Camino Real and San Bruno Avenue. Um, had a development agreement with a five year term and it was approved by city council in July, 2020, but the development agreement was amended at the request of the developer in September, 2022. At that time, the developer stated that market conditions were not advantageous to proceeding with construction, but they remained committed to developing the site. 
down the street at 271 El Camino Real, there's also a vacant lot, um, former Lee's Buffet, where there's 23 multifamily units that were approved by the Planning Commission in September 2021. That's also currently for sale. And at the corner of San Bruno Avenue and Glenview Drive, 29 single family homes were approved by the council June 2022, and that's also currently for sale. So again, a lot of these projects go through different ownerships. Um, El Camino Real, this is a renovation and conversion of an existing retail space into a preschool that would be operated by the Stratford School. This was approved by the Architecture Review Committee in June 2022, and right now the building permit's under review. So that should start construction um, next year. And down the street, 732 to 740 El Camino Real, there's 134 multifamily units project that's about 30% affordable at various levels, very low, low, moderate. They had a special ministerial approval that was issued in June 2022 pursuant to state law, commonly referred to as Senate Bill 35. Um, the building permit is anticipated soon, according to the developer, and may start construction next summer. And there's a state affordable housing tax credit application currently under review by the state. Important to note, this application met all the requirements of that state law and the city had no discretion, had to issue that ministerial approval letter. Right next door, 750 El Camino Real, is the former Melody Toyota, which has been vacant for a while. Um, a biotechnology lab and office building acquired that site and has proposed exterior, interior, and on-site improvements. Um, and that was approved by the Architecture Review Committee just last month. So those are all the projects that have been approved already. And again, some of them are proceeding with construction, submit the building permits, and some of them are you know, for sale or have a new owner contemplating what to do. But we have a lot of projects that are under review. And I won't spend too much time talking about these because they generally have public processes and meetings associated with them. Um, but I wanted to make sure everyone knew about projects that we're processing um, now. So the big one in the city is Tanferan, which superintendent spoke to just briefly, but that's a mixed use development that would encompass the entire 44 acre Tanferan site um, with approximately 1,000 units, a life science campus and retail space, including retention of Target and the Century Movie Theater. The preliminary project application was submitted in October and is under review. We have a lot of community engagement. I saw some of you at the um, grand opening of the public engagement space this past week. Um, and if you haven't been there, we'll have office hours starting this, uh, starting tomorrow for the next two months. If you want to learn more, please go to that project-specific website, which is tanfranforsanbruno.com. And we're launching a really cool virtual survey. We'll have other online um, engagement pieces, but the survey, I think, just launched. And if, if you'd rather be in person, though, please come to the community engagement space, which is really nifty inside the mall. Um, another project, I mentioned that auto dealership that will move across the street um, from its current location, and that would be a full service auto sales and service uh, dealership. It's really exciting, state of the art, and it's under review, and we anticipate it will go before the Planning Commission and City Council early next year. Uh, the superintendent mentioned 2010 Sneath Lane, the former Engvall School, the city's processing an application for 115 single family homes. It's currently under review and we're working on the environmental document for that. Um, and at 111 San Bruno Avenue, a previous, there was a previously approved project on that site, but we have a new project proposed with 46 multifamily units. Um, it was actually previously two property owners and two parcels and right now we're, um, we're processing an application for one of the properties um, and that's currently under review that you see here. And 170 San Bruno Avenue West, just down the street, there's a project with 42 multifamily units. The pre-application review was completed with the Architecture Review Committee review of that pre-app in May, and the formal application submittal is pending. Uh, but that's a, frankly a busy corridor, because right up the street we have another project on San Bruno Avenue, which is multifamily, 100% affordable. Applications currently under review with revisions pending. Um, Another school site, 300 Piedmont Avenue, the former Crestmore and Peninsula High Schools. There's 155 single family homes proposed there. Applications currently under review. We're about to kick off the environmental process. So I know that was a lot. That was a lot of projects. That said, everything I presented is on the city's website. 
and I would encourage everyone to go there. Um, we have a development activity hub, um, and the URL is shown here. And again, on each of these projects, there's a whole web page of lots of information. You can learn more about what stages it, these are in the process, if there's any documents that you can look at, um, and then who the contact is at the city if you have comments or questions on those individual projects. And with that, we'll start questions, but I'll return to my seat. Thank you. All right. So if there are any questions in the room uh, on any of the development projects that were reviewed or any questions from anyone on Zoom, we're happy to take those now. Okay, I'm looking around at the four um, people we have in the room in the council. I'm not seeing any hands and I'm not seeing any hands on Zoom. And so now we will go to uh, part three of our presentations. Uh, and I will um, first call up our fire chief, Ari DeLay, who will provide an overview of uh, two of our very important capital improvement projects. Um, uh, uh, fire Station 52 and a brief note on Fire Station 51. Good evening, everyone, uh, members of the council and members of the public. My name is Ari DeLay and I'm your fire chief here for the city of San Bruno. I'm here to uh, this evening to talk about from some of the activities surrounding some of our fire department facilities. Uh, the San Bruno Fire Department operates out of two fire, fire stations and serves our communities out of those two fire stations. Station 51 at 555 El Camino uh, is our central station where our administrative offices and uh, primary location uh, for our centralized services based out of, and Fire Station 52 at 1999 Earl Avenue. Both of our fire stations, I'm gonna hit the clicker here, sorry about that. Give me just a moment, I'm trying to get the PowerPoint up here. I'm gonna back up here in just a minute. All right. So both of our fire stations here uh, in the city of San Bruno are, they're some of the oldest fire stations in San Mateo County. Uh, and important to note, some of the primary concerns uh, for the fire department is both of these fire stations are not earthquake retrofitted. Uh, neither one of these fire stations is ADI compliant, and both of the fire stations, Station 51 and Station 52, lack some of the adequate size and configuration um, components to meet uh, modern all-risk fire service delivery that we need to operate today. Let's see if that moves ahead one slide. There we go. Okay, you see before you, this is Fire Station 52. This is when the neighborhood was uh, first built. There's not a home around it. The fire station is, is, is pretty stark looking out there. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's over um, 52 years old. <laughs> and uh, it's been, the city's been analyzing uh, the replacement of Fire Station 52 for many years, dating back to before the pg e gas pipeline explosion in that neighborhood. Station 52 was built in the late 1950s, and it serves as our city's second fire station, providing coverage to the western half of the city of San Bruno, and then back up into town when we have a larger incident. It also houses our on-duty firefighters, our fire engines, and other fire equipment that are critical components to the city's public safety. The station is currently in pretty poor condition. Although we do uh, quite a bit of maintenance, the facility itself is quite old, and it lacks, again, many of the modern uh, day features that are necessary for all risk fire service delivery. So in our analysis uh, of a fire stations and their condition, uh, we wanted to ensure that the 50, uh, fire station 52 uh, replacement took into account some of the most uh, up-to-date and comprehensive Im information that was available to us to evaluate the best location, the best configuration uh, for a potential new station. Is it the right place to keep it where it's at? Is it the right to maybe move it somewhere else? So it was determined that what we call a community risk assessment and standards of cover analysis was the best tool to be able to decide that location and configuration for the fire station. And the standards of cover study uh, has some components that are there before you on your screen. And uh, it talks about the age of the station, the condition, 
It's uh, not being seismically retrofitted, um, not having fire sprinklers, uh, not being ADA compliant, and a few other components that are important to the firefighters' health and safety that you'll see at the very bottom, including exercises rooms, being in the apparatus room where the smoke uh, from the diesel exhaust is in the same room that where we do physical fitness, and also the layout of the fire stations uh, was designed in a time that really didn't think about the speed and efficiency to get fire trucks out the door. So that standards of cover and community risk analysis, really uh, uh, one of the outputs of that study was to decide a zone which made the most sense for a fire station to best provide service to, to the community, um, not only the neighborhood in Fire Station 52's first due district, but other parts of our community as we see before you. Um, and if you see, there's a small circle there which kind of identifies a a premium zone for us to be able to del deliver that service to the best we can in the, the city of San Bruno. So it identified a zone. The consultant also identified what we would call kind of a, a choice parcel to be able to deliver that service uh, from a time perspective, but also the facility itself to have the, the adequate space to be able to provide that modern fire service delivery as I spoke of earlier. So the slide sh before you now, shows the ideal location based on response times and those required space requirements. Um, the, um, the size of the, and location allows the station to be constructed at, uh, and sufficient storage for some of our reserve apparatus and emergency equipment that is currently stored outside in trailers. So that location uh, that's been identified is at the intersection of Earl or Glenview and San Bruno Avenue. And that property is currently owned by Caltrans. The city has previously talked, been in talks with Caltrans about purchasing the property. However, Caltrans has recently moved the property uh, from its excess property list uh, as their maintenance division has identified the property as a, a lot to take place to be able to do training and heavy equipment operation for their employees. So it's an unfortunate circumstance uh, that's happened there, but we've begin, begun some preliminary discussions with elected officials uh, really kind of trying to gather some support and kind of uh, look for next steps and paths we could potentially take to acquire the property if it became available. And we're continuing with the site as our kind of our prime best, best location because of the needs of the department and the f currently to serve the community and into the future. Um, and again, the space requirements is the primary uh, driving force with that, and again, the response times that are outlined in that community risk assessment and standards of cover study. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it back over to the city manager and Matt Lee, our public works director. All right, um, any questions from anyone on uh, the presentation and discussion around fire station? Okay, looking at the city clerk. Any hands online? No hands are raised. Okay, we will go to our public works director, Matthew Lee, for a discussion of capital improvement projects. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Matt Lee. I'm the public works director for the city of San Bruno. Uh, Chief DeLay did a good uh, presentation on Fire Station 52, which is part of our capital improvement program. Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about other elements of the capital improvement program itself. Um, while we get the slides up and running. Um, I will uh, move on to the CIP by project categories. As you can see here, there are 10 asset categories in which uh, we maintain and develop our infrastructure. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking mainly tonight about our utilities which is the water, wastewater, and stormwater in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Chief DeLay has spoken about his uh, fire and facilities projects. I will also talk about uh, our streets projects, and we're gonna round it out with uh, Chief um, Director Matola from the Community Services Department to talk about uh, their facilities and parks projects. All that together counts for 93 projects currently in our CIP. Um, that's approximately $140 million uh, worth of CIP and uh, roughly $280 million over a five-year span. 
First, I'll move to the uh, water category uh, of projects, but before we go there, I want to take a step back and kind of just explain the water system itself. Uh, if you look in the two boxes here, uh, our water system can consist of the water supply side of the system and then the water distribution side. The water supply side of the system is kind of where we get our water. Uh, the city of San Bruno has five groundwater production wells and five connections to major transmission pipelines with uh, the SFPUC, which is the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, and the uh, North Coast County Water District. Uh, the distribution side itself uh, maintains and operates 120 miles of water main lines, eight pump stations, eight storage tanks, 13 pressure zones, 9,000 valves, 1,500 and 12,000 water meters. Uh, all in all, what that does is that supplies the city of San Bruno with 2.1 million gallons a day of supplied water. As we move into the uh, highlighted projects themselves, I wanna talk about the Acapella Well Project. Uh, this project is a project to replace a 25-year-old well which, was, which has ceased operations back in 2010. Uh, the Acapella well project was identified as part of an analysis that uh, found a location that was optimal for both the combination of water quality and production rate that could be produced out of it. This project will consist of two phases. One is the uh, construction of the actual well, uh, which you see in the photo uh, going down into the ground, and then the facilities itself as phase two. Construction is anticipated to begin in 2024. Next, we want to talk about the water main improvement and replacement program. Over the last five years, the city averages nearly 100 water main breaks a year with 111 in 21-22, or approximately one water main break every three to four days. This program is to replace the city's aging water main lines. However, what uh, we try to do at Public Works is we try to streamline our construction and impact the residents as as minimal as possible. And so with that effort, we also combine these projects uh, with the sewer mainline replacement projects. And uh, after we're done with that, we go in and do paving on those streets as well. And so you kind of get a three for one. Um, and so that's, that's the hope to minimize the impacts to the residents in the area. In terms of what we're looking to do in the next five years, uh, you see the map there in the blue. Uh, we have four distinct uh, zones and those are the ones that we would be working on. Uh, that area is generally known as the avenues. Um, so in terms of timelines for projects, we have an avenues 3-1 project, which is currently in construction and is anticipation, anticipating completion in 2023 with the avenues 2-1 project, uh, which is anticipating design complete in 2023 and construction start shortly thereafter. And then the avenues 3-2 design um, is anticipated to be complete in 2024. Moving on to uh, pump, water pump stations improvements and replacement program. Uh, the water pump program is to replace water pump stations and equipment such as pumps and motors, backup generators, security improvements, as well as the demolition and reconstruction of entire pump stations. Currently, the timelines for uh, the projects in this program, we have the design of the Sneath Lane and the Lake Street pump station, which is anticipated to be complete in 2023 with construction short, starting shortly thereafter. Next, we wanna uh, talk about the water tank and replacement program. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, larger programs uh, just because of the general cost of the water tanks themselves. As you can see, this is one of our newly built water tanks. It's made of concrete. Uh, it has a solid foundation that can keep uh, the water tank in place uh, when water is sloshing around during an earthquake. This is one of our existing water tanks that's currently in operation right now. It's made of steel. Uh, it's, it's on a flat foundation. And as you, uh, for those that are aware, that actually is uh, troublesome uh, during times of seismic activity. The tank replacement program itself is mainly to do seismic retrofits, rehabilitate tanks, and other significant modifications to existing water tanks. Uh, the timelines for the tanks that we are planning to work on is the Cunningham Drive and Sweeney Ridge uh, tank designs will be anticipated to be completed in 2024. The Cunningham Drive construction is anticipated to be completed in 2024 as well, and the Sweeney Ridge construction is anticipated to be completed in 2025. Uh, the reason why we stagger those tanks is that we have to have tanks online. Um, operation does not cease as we're working on tanks, so we're uh, delicately balancing operations and replacing the tanks as quickly as we can. 
Next, I'll move to the wastewater category. Um, just taking a step back in terms of our wastewater system, uh, wastewater is broken into two categories, uh, wastewater collection and wastewater treatment. Our wastewater collection system consists of 90 miles of sewer pipe, which is roughly the distance from here to Sacramento, uh, with 2,415 2, main line segments and roughly about 2,040 sewer man holes uh, and six pump stations. The wastewater treatment side, we have a joint powers agreement with the city of South San Francisco and other neighboring cities um, to treat wastewater um, and we manage approximately about 3.4 million gallons of effluent daily on average. Um, this may look very similar to the water main uh, replacement program because generally it is except for the sewer side and as mentioned earlier, we combine those projects to reduce impacts to the residents. Um, the updates are generally the same because we combine the sewer line and water line replacement projects in the same project itself. Uh, moving next to our wastewater pump station improvement and replacement program. Uh, this is to replace the pump stations and associated force main pipelines associated with it. Uh, uh, good news is the Crestwood pump station is our last pump station uh, that has been, that needs to be replaced or that will be replaced uh, during this cycle. Uh, the Crestwood pump station is um, in design and is anticipated to complete in 2024 and construction to start shortly thereafter. Next, I'll move to the water quality control plant. Uh, under, as mentioned earlier, under a joint powers agreement with South San Francisco and other municipalities, the city of San Bruno has 25% responsibility for their water quality control plant. This control plant was uh, initiated in 1952 and operation has not ceased since. Uh, it is 70 years old and I think we're coming, well, we are actually on our 70th anniversary for this treatment plant and it's served us well. Um, we have wastewater professionals working there 24 hours a day, 305, 365 days a year to ensure that we properly treat all our effluent. Um, the team itself is an award-winning water quality control plant team. They're recognized as California's 2019 and 2021 medium-sized plant of the year by the California Water Environment Association. In terms of the CIP themselves, which we uh, are responsible for 25% of, uh, as you can see within the plant themselves, uh, there is a variety of construction going on, uh, a large amount that has, uh, has occurred since the early 2000s. Uh, there's a digester uh, replacement that is at about 95% complete uh, in the blue. In the purple, there's aeration basins that is at about 95% complete. Uh, there's a secondary clarifier in red and uh, in yellow, the stormwater stations. All that uh, approximately contributes in terms of 25% is about 3.5 million a year in capital improvement projects. Moving on next to the stormwater category, um, I'm gonna take a step back and talk about the stormwater system itself. Our stormwater system is a network of pipes and service conveyances that collects rainwater runoff from six watersheds, which is approximately 29,000 acres of impervious surface. Uh, it conveys the rainwater through the San Bruno Channel to the San Francisco Bay. Um, other facts about it is that much of our San Bruno's aging water system has been in use since the early 1900s and the stormwater fees have not been adjusted since 1994 at a minimum of $46.16 per assessed parcel. Uh, this is a uh, slide with a lot of information so I, I want to take a little time to kind of talk through the legend of it. Uh, this is a fund balance slide. If you look at the numbers on the left, those are the remaining fund balance for the sewer, uh, sorry, stormwater enterprise program. Uh, anything uh, in parentheses in blue is, is negative. Um, the blue box is our fund balance. Uh, when it turns red is when it goes into the negative. The green line is our revenues and the black dotted line is our expenditures. As you can see, uh, starting this year, we are going, uh, we are going into the negative. Um, for our stormwater fund. Uh, the system has aged and the cost to meet infrastructure needs have increased and the city has not been able to collect sufficient revenue to replace, repair the aging water system. General fund has backfilled with subsidies but increasing pressures on the general fund has, make it, has made it difficult. In 2021, the city held a mallet, mail ballot property owner election to increase storm drainage and flood protection fees. The initiative was rejected by voters overwhelmingly. In 2022, a city poll indicated that the voting population was not for a stormwater tax. 
Without additional revenues, staff are making every effort to minimize operation expenses and selectively delay the improvement projects. Stormwater fund balance stayed positive in 2021, 2022 fiscal year only because the city was able to transfer $1 million from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act, known as ARPA, to fund the enterprise. The financial forecast projects a negative fund balance this year with the negative fund balance increasing each year thereafter. Planned emergency stormwater capital improvement projects will be funded by the general fund due to the lack of dedicated stormwater fees. The city continues to look for funding options to keep stormwater maintenance operation regulatory compliance functioning, as well as looking for avenues to fund capital improvements and repairs. Identifying stormwater revenues is a priority for the city. Now I wanna go into kind of the conditions of some of our storm drains. As we mentioned, uh, some of these are, are pretty old. Uh, if you look at the photos in, on the top, uh, those are corrugated metal pipes uh, with visible holes and collapse pipes. On the bottom, you'll see uh, our concrete culverts underground. Some of them are starting to spall um, and need repair. Other examples are uh, flood events uh, that occurred over the last decade. As you can see, these are on three areas of, within the city. Uh, most recent impacts uh, are some erosion at Buckeye Park due to storm uh, water uh, failures and a sinkhole at 2850 Sneath Lane, which uh, was authorized to be repaired this fiscal year. Uh, these projects are typically funded out of our operation funds or uh, we go to council for emergency funds to make urgent repairs. Um, I'm gonna try to see if I can have someone play the video on the right-hand side of the screen, Is there, if it's possible for you to click that. So this is a Spyglass Drive in 2017 during the storm. Um, because uh, of uh, the storm drain system capacity issues, it caused flooding. Uh, fortunately for us, fortunately for us, we were able to uh, received funding assistance from the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Grant in 2021 to mitigate the flooding issues during intense storm events on Spyglass. Uh, this project is currently in construction and is anticipated to be complete by 2023. Another area of flood uh, is 7th and Walnut. Uh, that's near the 380 overpass and uh, near the San Bruno Avenue Creek. Um, this is a complex area with multiple jurisdictions and uh, complex reasons for why there's currently flooding. Uh, the city of San Bruno has partnered with One Shoreline, uh, which is helping us with uh, some of the solutions to the flooding in the area. Most recently, they've repaired a tide gate uh, out at the San Bruno Creek um, near the bay, and that has reduced some of the flooding during high tides, and they're currently also uh, working to apply for a FEMA flood mitigation assistance grant to help, uh, for, uh, to help identify a solution to uh, reduce flooding during heavy rainstorms. Now on to the streets categories. Uh, the street system are classified by functional types such as arterials, collectors, and residential streets. For example, uh, San Bruno Avenue is an arterial, Elm and Cherry is a collector, residential streets are Maple, Olive, and Acacia. Uh, if you can imagine you live on a residential street, you'll drive to a collector, which will then feed into a main arterial road like San Bruno Avenue. As you go through these streets, you see all types of infrastructures, traffic devices, pavement markings, street signs, street lights, traffic signals, traffic calling measures. All these various types of infrastructures are what get upgraded or repaired as part of the streets asset category. So in terms of our street system, we have about 180 lane miles of road. That's roughly uh, from San Bruno to Sacramento and back. Uh, we have uh, approximately 180 miles of curb and gutter, uh, 37 signalized intersections, uh, 20 of which are maintained by Caltrans and 17 by the city of San Bruno, approximately 2,000 street lights and 6,000 traffic signs. Um, within the asset category themselves, uh, there are multiple programs. Uh, I wanted to first talk about the paving program itself. Um, in 2019, the community passed a local sales tax uh, measure called Measure G to help fund various infrastructure improvements, but most importantly, it was to help with paving and the support of, and with the support of council, over $6 million has been appropriated to paving projects in the last two fiscal years. 
Coupled with the water and sewer main replacement projects in, in the avenues, uh, this will be the largest amount of paving projects that have been done in a fiscal year for a very long time. Uh, you'll start to notice work in the streets in the next few years. Uh, totaling up all the projects uh, for the next uh, fiscal year, uh, it's approximately about $11.3 million worth of uh, street uh, paving improvements. Before we get to the projects themselves, I want to kind of take a step back and kind of talk about uh, maintenance of payment and the, and the theory behind it. Um, as you guys can see here, this is a very complex slide, but uh, I'll, I'll walk us through it. If you look at the red line, that's the deterioration curve, uh, which is essentially uh, when you have new pavement, it stays in a good condition for the time being, and then over time, it starts to deteriorate. At some point, it starts to deteriorate at a very rapid rate. Um, so the intent of, of pavement maintenance is to try to do what it, you see in the blue line, is to try to preserve and extend the life of the pavement uh, before it reaches its sharp decline in deterioration. Uh, the graph on the left is the pavement condition index. That's just a way for us to rate the pavement conditions themselves. The uh, numbers on the bottom in the X axis is the time over years. Uh, if you look at the multiple colors, uh, the green color is the area when the, when the pavement condition is in good condition and can be preserved by uh, pavement preservation uh, procedures uh, and methodologies such as slurry sealing or crack sealing. When it gets into the orange, uh, that's when you start to see cracks in the roads, but there's no structural deficiencies yet. And so because they're just surface cracks, over time you can do that, you can uh, repair those by doing overlays. Uh, if you let that go for too long, uh, those cracks will allow water to seep through, which will undermine the base and the foundation of the road which will then get to an area in the red, which is in the lower portion, which is uh, the highest cost to repair, and that's the reconstruction, which is replacing the surface and the base. Uh, a typical cost for these projects um, uh, is here. Uh, I wanted to first kind of talk about the images on the left. Uh, as you can see, uh, that's a pavement cross-section. Uh, SW stands for sidewalk, AC stands for asphalt concrete, and AB stands for aggregate base. Um, what we have is the three different uh, types of repairs that we do for the roads in San Bruno. Uh, the first type is a slurry seal in green. Uh, that's just a surface that covers the road, uh, the wearing surface to, to try to extend the life of a good road. Our goal is to try to do slurry seal as many good streets as we can to continue to extend the life so that we can save funds to be able to repair the roads uh, that, that are failing. That's uh, an approximate cost for Cherry Avenue between Genevieve and Niles. It's about $50,000. That's 1,000 lineal feet. Uh, the next uh, type of repair is a rehabilitation. Um, that's the one in orange in the middle. Uh, as part of the rehabilitation project itself, that's the two-inch overlay uh, of asphalt that can help preserve the cracks. That's done in that deterioration curve in the middle when cracks are starting to uh, repair. It doesn't matter where on that deterioration curve in orange, you could do it right in the beginning when it starts to fall, or you can do it when it's about to get in the red. Uh, that's when you can make those repairs. One thing I will highlight, um, it is about $400,000, approximately eight times the cost of a slurry seal. Uh, one of those additional costs are the requirements, the federal requirements for us to upgrade curb ramps when we do these overlays. Um, and then the third and final one is the total reconstruction. Uh, that's the one in red where you're replacing both the asphalt concrete and places of the asphalt base that has failed. Um, and that's approximately $850,000, which is about 17 times the cost of our slurry seal project itself. So moving on to what we anticipate in doing in the next year, uh, the green is the slurry seal that we talked about. Uh, these are the uh, uh, preliminary roads. We're going through the design process right now, and uh, these are the candidates that we anticipate that we may be working on. Next is going to be the street rehabilitation road. Um, as you notice, there's a lot more orange than there was green, and that's just because of the fact that we did have Measure G, and we're really trying to catch up and increase our PCI over time. Um, and so that's, this is where we can make the most bang for our buck. If we can get these roads up to uh, a pavement condition index of 100 again, then we can start slurry sealing more roads over time. Uh, the, and the last one is the street reconstruction. These are the ones where we're doing uh, significant repairs to the roads. Uh, 
we uh, discussed it at uh, our previous council meetings with utilizing the state SB1 funds to do these repairs. Uh, now, obviously for me, I would love to repair all roads, um, but we just don't have the funds available to do it all at once. And so there is a strategy behind how we apply this to try to bring the pavement condition index for the entire city uh, up. Uh, so now, I have our streets program, uh, paving is not the only projects that we work on. I wanted to highlight a couple of other projects as well. The, uh, sorry, I jumped too far ahead. So the uh, bicycle and pedestrian improvement program. Uh, this is one, one program uh, which I hold near and dear to my heart because I'm an avid bicyclist myself. Uh, we tried to establish a bicycle and pedestrian network to promote safety, connectivity, and efficiency to and convenience for alternative transportation modes. Uh, there's uh, multiple projects that are happening in this, but the one I really want to highlight is these Huntington Avenue projects. Um, the Huntington Avenue projects, the whole intent of these three projects is to allow for a bicycle path up uh, north, north and south side of the city on Huntington to connect to various areas and uh, transit options. Um, the photo on the right, or the project on the right, the Huntington Avenue and Santonio San Antonio Rehabilitation Project was a paving project in itself, but that was strategically done because it's in, it's in anticipation for all the other projects that are uh, to help connect the, the bikeway. Uh, that project has been completed in 2021. Uh, the project in the middle, the Huntington Avenue and San Antonio Bicycle Corridor Project is the one that is currently under construction right now uh, where we're working on curb ramps, putting in bike sharrows, paving, and uh, doing some um, bulb outs for crossings. Uh, that, is, uh, that is being completed. And then the Huntington Avenue improvements is the most northern portion of Huntington Avenue where there will be a cycle track installed. Uh, there is currently funding for design uh, for this project uh, going uh, all the way up into BART. Uh, and it is anticipated that the design would be completed uh, by, uh, the B, by early 2023. Next, I want to talk about the pedestrian safety and traffic calming program. Um, there are multiple projects that happen on there. Uh, TSPC studies is one of the projects where when we receive resident complaints, uh, we work through uh, the TSPC uh, and to present monthly traffic studies to TSPC for recommendations and we implement, implement them there. The local roadway safety plan is a draft safety project part that is a safety plan that we're utilizing to help us prioritize uh, which projects to initially work on. Uh, there's also a pedestrian warning and safety project. Uh, that's, we're preparing bids for those documents right now, and we plan to advertise them in the upcoming year. The Oak Avenue and Crystal Spring traffic improvements. Uh, this project is currently under design at 60%, and the, antici the anticipated goal is to have that project complete uh, by the time uh, the RAC opens in fall of 2023. And then uh, most, uh, most importantly, is there's the San Bruno and Cherry intersection improvements. That project was uh, recently completed, and it was to a modified intersection and add a left turn pocket, flashing yellow, and pedestrian refuge at that intersection. Uh, one other important project uh, program itself is the sidewalk repair program. Uh, this is program is to help remove sidewalk uplift caused by city trees and or trip hazards. Uh, in 2022, uh, the city completed a sidewalk repair project. Uh, in 2023, we're anticipating uh, piloting a sidewalk cutting project that will allow us to eliminate trip hazards um, and potentially do more uh, surface area than we could with the funds that would be applied to a, a repair project. So we're working on that. Uh, another uh, big plan that's gonna help us identify a, a variety of projects is a Safe Routes to School plan. It's um, its plan is to aim to increase the number of students who choose to act, actively sh uh, use shared modes of transportation to school by making it safer and more accessible to walking, biking, and or taking transit. Uh, this Safe Routes to School plan uh, was uh, developed in, in, uh, in conjunction with the community and the schools uh, in our city. And uh, we anticipate that the final plan will go to city council for early acceptance in uh, 2023. And now onto the facilities category itself. Uh, the city 
has 17 facilities that it manages, uh, nine of which are uh, public facilities for use. Um, but I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Director Matola uh, so she can uh, provide a discussion on the uh, RAC. So the, uh, uh, before I hand it over, uh, the rack uh, currently is under construction at the moment. Uh, as you can see, uh, there, there is a website where you can uh, take a look at the progress of construction. Uh, it's uh, no longer a pit or a hole in the ground like the YouTube uh, uh, project. There, there is steel and it's going vertical. It's in the process of being constructed. Um, and uh, I will hand it over to Director Matola to talk about the elements of the building. We'll bring Matthew up uh, after Director Matola. Thank you. Again, my name is Ann Matola. I am the Community Services Director for San Bruno. And I'm really excited to kind of reintroduce everybody to this project. You've seen a mess at City Park. It's been a while since we've seen the renderings of what's going to be open and accessible to the public in just about a year from now. So I just want to take a really uh, quick look at the site. And I think you all may be familiar that this is the former site before um, we started construction. At the top center, you can see the former Veterans Recreation Center and the separate um, pool that's at the lower left of the image. And that facility was a little over 29,000 um, square feet. And so on the same site, more where the Veterans um, Memorial Recreation Center was located, we're replacing um, kind of the two separate unrelated facilities into one cohesive recreation and aquatic facility. It'll be about 50,000 square feet of programming space and indoor natatorium. And then we do have the additional um, swimming pool, the outdoor swimming pool, as well as a really large plaza space. And just to kind of give you a a little bit of a sneak peek of what should be here in about a year. That is what the entry drive will look like from City Park entering to the um, facility campus. So I wanted to um, give you a quick overview of the various program areas that are going to be within the site. There are two levels to the facility. On the ground floor, we have all of our aquatics programming with an indoor and outdoor pool. Our gymnasium, which is in the center of the facility, there are also a number of conference and meeting rooms. And on the upper level, we have all of our fitness areas. There's a fitness center, um, an indoor track, and a group exercise room. And there's also a community hall. And we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at each of those. Um, so this is when you enter into the facility. We have a main lobby and community lounge. So it is going to be a place where there's free Wi-Fi, and it's an access point. Um, for informal gatherings. It is a community living room. Um, during the visioning of this project with the community, that was something that the community really wanted to see as part of this. So it's going to be a very welcoming space, as well as being home to the community services department. The slides don't want to change so well. Um, the meeting rooms run along a corridor and they have really great, there's really great view into the different meeting rooms. There are two larger meeting rooms. Actually, it's one large meeting room which can be divided into two by a divider wall or can be used as one large space. And then there's a smaller meeting room which also has its in, an independent restroom and the idea for that was that we could use it for um, preschool level type programs, childcare, uh, drop-in site for people that are using the fitness center. And so that is, um, those are the summaries of the meeting rooms. The community hall is the big, grand, um, 2,700 square foot rental space that'll be on the second level of the facility. And it has really beautiful views of the park. This room also can be divided into two smaller rooms. And it really has a lot of flexible uses for lifelong programming, conferences, um, different private events like receptions and parties. It'll be kind of a core to our rental function in, that pro in this facility.
Um, the gymnasium space is a really large, wonderful new gymnasium. I know that we have a lot of nostalgia connected to the one, to the former gymnasium. But this one has some pretty special features. Uh, one of the things that we really like about this, which will maximize the use, is that we have a drop-down divider so we can have different programs concurrent in the space. And this will be um, really wonderful for the different um, drop-in programs. And so we can use it for drop-in programs and fitness programs and rentals. So it'll have a lot of flexibility for the community. I mentioned our fitness center um, is located on the second floor. And so we will have an area with a combination of cardio, weight, and strength and conditioning equipment. We also have a really amazing feature of the indoor track that is, um, runs the perimeter of the gym. It's elevated over the gymnasium. And there's also a group exercise room that will be used for both fitness classes and, and dance classes offered through our enrichment programs. So that pretty much concludes a walkthrough. Um, if you want more about what we're doing with this, you may want to tune into the December 13th special meeting and we'll talk more about the Recreation Center. But I do want to give you a little um, overview on three active park projects that we have going on right now. The first is Centennial Plaza. We'll also give you an update on Posey Park and the Florida Avenue Park project. So the Centennial Plaza project, um, staff began working on this in April of 2021 when we proposed to city council um, some improvement projects in the downtown. And one of them was temporary, uh, some temporary improvements to Centennial Plaza to increase accessibility and make it a usable park space. The initial allocation for the project at that time was $150,000. So after that initial discussion, and we began work on the, on the project proposing these temporary aesthetic improvements, we understood that there was more complexity to the site and the project grew with technical issues. And there was an indication that we needed a much more formal process and design um, and also a formal construction process for this project. So we began working with our on-call landscape architectural services group, Calendar and Associates, um, and worked with the, city's downtown, the city council downtown committee to refine the design of the park um, and kind of make it this beautiful community plaza space. So in the renderings, you can see, well, a photograph of the existing site, and then below it is an image kind of of the vantage point of San Mateo Avenue at Gen Genevin looking into the park. So this concept was created um, so we could have this flexible space that could support a wide variety of activities like concerts, farmers markets, downtown events, dining areas. We wanted to have a mix of passive and play areas so it appealed to a broad demographic of users. The idea of this is really for it to be, be a catalyst site for the downtown to reimagine and energize this part of the city. So in August of this year, council supported the project and directed staff to seek funding from the San Bruno Community Foundation to partner in realizing this vision. Um, the foundation did agree to do that at their November 2nd meeting, and they awarded the city with a grant of 500,000 um, to contribute towards this project. And so the point that we're at with the project is um, we need to bid the project so we get the actual full true cost. We estimate it will be about 900,000. Um, and so including that 500 and the original 150, there is a little bit of gap funding, but we wanna have that accurate number before we bring it back to council. So we'll be working on construction documents for the project um, so that hopefully we can bring this back to council um, and then have um, the bid developed by summer of 2023 and then enter into construction and have this built hopefully in early 2024. So the next, yeah, the next project is Posey Park. So this project we also um, presented to City Council in April 2021 as part of a discussion about downtown improvements. If you're familiar with the site, there are quite a few challenges um, with the existing conditions. So I think most of you are aware that this is a really large scale um, fountain. It's a water feature, but it was turned off about five or six years ago uh, for a number of reasons and partly was due to failure of the waterproofing of the structure as of the um, waterproofing membrane to the structure as well as failure of the structure itself. 
If you were to take a close look at this structure, it is, um, there are areas of exposed rebar and spalling of the concrete, the waterproofing, um, the seal coat is peeling off. And so the site, and the site, if you look at it as a park, it's rather stark and uninviting, and there are very few amenities that make it an inviting space for either active or passive use. So staff presented several um, options to improve the site, and council supported a recommendation to, report, to repurpose the fountain basins as planting and landscaped areas, add more seating amenities, and incorporate mural work into the site. So the initial estimated cost for this project is 575,000, and we did receive a Measure K grant of $200,000 for this project. Let me do that. Um, so we began started working again with Calendar and Associates on this project, and we're targeting completion of a conceptual design by Q2 of 2023. When we work on this process with Calendar, it will also include a revised estimate, similar to the Centennial project. We have to understand this is a complex site and may require different work than initially anticipated. Also similar to Centennial, the desire of stakeholders, they may inform improvements beyond the initial con concept that we may want to revisit. And the last park um, I want to talk about this evening is Florida Avenue Park. Uh, the parcel where the site is located at 324 Florida Ave was purchased by the city back in 2014. It's about a half an acre. Um, and it's ideally located for a new park in the city, um, as this part of the city is rather underserved by park amenities. In September 2020, um, what you see here, the grass um, and the irrigation were installed, and it was an interim measure to open the site to the community while staff was looking for grant funding to build a park. Also in 2020, a concept plan, oops, also in 2020, a concept plan and construction estimate for the site were developed. And so the concept includes a children's play area with play equipment, equipment and rubberized um, playing surface. This park includes adult exercise features, including a cardio cost and multi-generational play equipment, um, a lawn with turf or drought tolerant grass, um, additional trees per the city's um, tree standards, um, the idea of this was to become a neighbor, neighborhood square um, with paving and picnic tables and a little pedestrian path and seating. With this concept plan and, constru and construction estimate in hand, we, we did apply for funding through the Prop 68 Park Development and Community Revitalization Grant Program, but unfortunately we were notified in December of 2021 that the funds would not be awarded to San Bruno for this project. However, the city does remain committed to realizing the community vision to build this park and will identify funding through the upcoming 2022-23 budget process and through other grant and or through other grant alternative funding opportunities. Since so that concludes, I think, all the capital projects, I'll turn it over to our city manager. Perfect. Thank you, Director Matola and uh, Director Matt Lee. Uh, we are uh, now open for any questions on the material um, uh, that was presented or uh, anything else related to development in San Bruno. And I think we have a question from someone in the room. Um, yes, this is for uh, Director Lee. I wanted to um, ask some questions and I, I beg your pardon if I'm not using the right language uh, or concepts. Of course, we have very aging infrastructure you know, water, sewer, so on. I n noted that at the city park, it seems that they put in some bioswales um, with the culverts that run off, and I love that. I tried to talk to um, Wendy's at the time that they were resurfacing their lot, <laughs> asking, you know, would they be interested in that? And, you know, they weren't. They just wanted to repave it. I am wondering if there is an opportunity at this point of all the development in San Bruno and also our needs um, as are being articulated because of the flooding that we have, you know, the drought, the water problems, so on and so forth. Cities everywhere who have paved ourselves over have, you know, interrupted that whole hydrological cycle. So I'm wondering if there are any requirements 
in the landscaping for bioswales at any of these projects or schools. Um, and requirements sometimes are hard. Um, so I wonder if it could be conceived of as both for residential uh, parcels as well as any of the development parcels, any incentives that can be put out there for bioswales, for, I know when there's new construction on residential, you know, they put in dry creek beds. I think we'd probably do better and have less flooding overall if we could incentivize, you know, more individual residential uh, neighbors, neighborhoods to just put, um, not dry, dry wells, you know, to manage their water on their own site. I, you know, overflow, runoff, runoff to the bay, so on and so forth. Other incentives for um, recycling water on your own site, you know, has this already been talked about maybe in the city? Any way to financially incentivize residents or others to manage water better um, by these design and opportunity requirements as opposed to continue to plug a lot of money into our large scale systems? Thank you. Uh, what, what, I'll, what I'll state is that I think Historically, for stormwater conveyance, the thought, the prevailing thought process was capture the water as much as you can and just push it to the bay. And we now know that that is not the best solution. So there is emerging technology, emerging design of water out of. And so I think that's the new prevailing thought process for stormwater capture and, and conveyance. Environmental effort is usually more the uh, stick than the carrot. Um, so for, there are requirements for, they have to build it. Um, the challenge with this infrastructure is that it's very cost prohibitive. Um, it's, not, it's not as simple as like, hey, if I'm gonna pave Wendy's, I can just build this in there. It's, it's really gonna blow the Wendy budget <laughs> for everything. And so um, uh, I think that's the, that right now that's the current process. We have requirements for it uh, to incentivize. There's not a lot of uh, grants out there for, I guess you would say residents. Um, uh, there's, there's even grants that are kind of far and few between uh, for cities uh, unless it's like more of a regional effort. And so uh, we actively try to look for those grants and try to apply them and line them up when we can for uh, our road and streetscape projects. If I don't know how to uh, ask about these concepts properly, but is there some cost benefit analysis that it really would be in the interest of off your water bill this month or tax bill or storm water if you put in a dry well. I mean, beyond, I understand large projects, you know, it is costly, I understand that. But I mean, w this is the critical time with all the infrastructure going in. We don't have enough permeable pavement and we're just baking ourselves and we're losing water. I mean, not only when we get these flash floods and they're, you know, creating havoc and costing a lot, but we literally should be capturing water and recharging our system. It just seems there has to be some county way. I mean, individual homeowners, you know, get them to do it beyond, you know, the big projects. Hi, Darcy Smith, Assistant City Manager. I'll just make a plug that Bosca, who we purchased, or who we're a member of, Bosca, we have our our council representative here, they actually have a lot of programs for different rebates for ripping out your lawn, for example, and, and replacing it with more water efficient landscaping. They also have water, sorry, landscape education classes that are more geared towards single family homeowners. So there's a plug and we'll make sure we have information on our website to that. Um, but there's actually a lot of resources more at a regional level to support um, these efforts or smaller entities like homeowners. What a regional stormwater capture project. Uh, it is funded almost exclusively by grants. Um, it, it's actually up in the uh, area near 280 and, and 380. And the concept it, it's being studied right now and, and designed is to create a stormwater capture system where you can actually store that water and, and let it uh, gradually percolate into the underground aquifers. That project, I actually don't know how many millions it is, but I, I think it's over a $40 million project. 
we here in the city of San Bruno do not have the funds. Uh, as the public works director mentioned, our stormwater system is a million dollars uh, underwater each year. Uh, the only way we were able to fund that million dollars last year is that we had federal money because of the COVID recovery that we were able to put towards that. The city of San Bruno has a 100-year-old stormwater system, and the fees haven't been increased in 25 years. On average, every homeowner pays about $46 a year. And right now, those funds aren't even covering the unlikely another $20 million worth of other projects. And a, a ground total of zero has been done towards that. Uh, outside of the, um, 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 we have spent money on our stormwater system. Unfortunately, it's been because of failures, right? You remember that a few years ago, we almost lost a portion of San Bruno Avenue due to a stormwater pipe erosion. Uh, there was an area near uh, Juniper Serra Park where there was a hillside erosion. Uh, and the reality is our infrastructure for stormwater is crumbling around us and, and the city has to find ways to raise more money for stormwater. And while yes, there is money coming in for development projects, we know based on studies that were done several years ago that the city has more than $300 million of infrastructure needs, and, and that's just the known needs. Uh, and so while, yes, there's development happening, uh, the truth of the matter is development won't solve this problem, uh, and we really need to continue to look forward uh, to ways to raise revenue for our stormwater system. Um, and while we can get grants for specific projects, um, um, it, it really has to be funded locally. I think we have a question from our uh, vice mayor. Oh, thank you. Um, this question is for the assistant city manager. Um, thank you for the presentation. One of the most common questions I think we get as council members is what's going on with all this development that is you know, submitted? And I saw the slide around entitlements and I think a lot of us understand the process, but in a very simple, simplistic so the simplest answer is that a project that's just been submitted for review is going through a public process with meetings, input, reviews, environmental documents, analysis. So kind of in the analysis phase, if you will, and that involves community input and decision-making bodies reviewing them at different levels. An approved project is ready to start construction. So, and that generally is a kind of less public process, although the public sees the activities, it ha a lot of the work, for example, to review the building permits happens behind the counter, and then we issue the permit and it starts construction. So part of it is very public, a lot of involvement. And, and then once it's approved, um, who's re whose responsibility at that point is it to actually begin construction? The developers, yes, the developers' Thank you. responsibility. And I'll emphasize that when the city's processing it, we have timelines that we're often bound to by state law. For example, when a, when a submittal is made to the city, we typically under state law have 30 days to review it and give comments back. Um, so our timelines are pretty tight. There's timelines about environmental review, for example. But when it's approved, the developer has a period of time. Usually the projects are approved for two years. So they have a long time within which they could submit building permits and then sometimes there's extensions given um, or other other time frames but largely shifts from the city being managing the process and controlling the timeline to it being in the developer property owner's hands Hi, Charles Meyer, uh, San Bruno resident, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you all. Um, I'm impressed with the diligence and the completeness with which all the different areas of our city seems to be uh, being looked after at the time. And with the sheer number of projects and their complexity, all your efforts are very much appreciated by this resident. Thank you. All right, Madam City Clerk. Um, no hands are raised. No hands are raised uh, uh, online. Uh, and so with that, uh, I really want to thank everyone for coming out um, and turn it over to Mayor Medina.
I have the big role of adjourning the meeting. Um, but first and foremost, I want to thank the superintendent, uh, Matthew Duffy, for being here this evening and making this presentation. I also want to thank the uh, staff that is here that has made the presentations. Um, they had asked, uh, probably rightfully so in their professional opinion, especially through our city manager, to please wait till next year. Uh, however, I would say it was unanimous uh, at that meeting for council to say, no, please do it in December. So um, with that, I want to thank all of you because you um, went ahead and did it um, as asked. And I understand that uh, your desire was next year. So with that puts constraints, with that puts demands, and with that means we're imposing upon the other work of the day-to-day -day operations of this city. So I, as mayor, well, we want to personally thank each and every one of you for doing that and making that sacrifice and uh, making this evening happen. And I want to thank all the rest of the staff that is here as well that had other roles and aspects in from getting us on live uh, streaming, YouTube, Channel One, and all the support that we receive. And with that, we'll go ahead and...